thank you everybody for uh, tuning in and for uh, John Peach for um, inviting me to uh, be one of the uh, speakers. I'm honored to be with uh, on a panel with or on a series with so many uh, scholars and, and writers who I admire. So thank you uh, for that, John, and thank you everybody for, for tuning in. Uh, very quickly, who I am, uh, my name is um, Eric Hirschtel. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, um, and I study uh, the intersection between slavery and science most fundamentally. Uh, my first book just came out uh, over the summer with Yale University Press. It's called The Science of Abolition. Uh, and the book sort of uh, looks at the role that scientific ideas, um, including but not uh, by no means exclusively to racial science. By that I mean chemistry, geology, the ways in which abolitionists and science, uh, scientific thinkers who were sympathetic towards abolitionism, abolitionism used scientific ideas to discredit slaveholders. Uh, and what I am planning on, on speaking a little bit more specifically today is one of uh, an important figure in my book named Dr. Benjamin Rush. Uh, and I think uh, John wants me to speak specifically about uh, a, a peer reviewed article that I wrote a few years ago about Benjamin Rush's ideas about race uh, and how he used them to actually attack slavery. That's excellent. So thank you for being here. And uh, I'm very excited about your article, uh, Anti-Slavery Science in the Early Republic, which I'll probably have a link below. Um, so if you could maybe tell us first and foremost who Benjamin Rush was, and then we can get into his ideas. Sure. Um, so Benjamin Rush was uh, arguably the most important, respected American physician uh, in the revolutionary era and into the early republic. Uh, he was born, I believe, I'm forgetting now, but roughly 17, uh, I want to say 1746 uh, in, in Pennsylvania. He was not a Quaker, although he was clearly influenced by the kind of um, anti-slavery um, uh, culture that, that Quakers were, were shaping um, in the 1750s and 60s. He ultimately um, quickly rises uh, in the ranks of the kind of, you know, national scientific community in, in, in Philadelphia, uh, knows, of course, Benjamin Franklin, who's the kind of most important figure. Uh, and he really sort of gains national stature during the Revolutionary War when he is um, made one of, not the, but, uh, you know, one, I think an assistant surgeon general, something like this in the Continental Army. It doesn't last long, but it puts him on the map, uh, and he goes on to publish several very influential scientific and more specifically medical arg arguments that are both making a kind of medical argument for independence, and as we'll see a little bit in this talk, uh, making a medical case for emancipation. And I will end it by saying that he ultimately becomes uh, a medical professor at uh, the University of Pennsylvania, which in the late 18th century is, is the most important uh, medical school in the, in the country, one of the few medical schools in the country. He educates you know, dozens of influential, um, what were then called men of science, what today we would call scientists. And finally, uh, he's not only sympathetic towards anti-slavery, he's actually extremely well involved in the abolitionist community in Philadelphia. He becomes even president of the most influential um, abolitionist, organized abolitionist society, the Pennsylvania Abolition Society in 18, in the early, in the first couple of years of 1800. Um, and he would be deeply involved with abolitionism, working with black abolitionists from the 1780s onward. Thank you. So the, uh, one of the opening, uh, her, um, sentences of your article says that, because uh, I kind of want to get into Benjamin Rush's ideas on race first, mm -hmm. and then we can talk about the, the, how it tied into the political and the medical. But um, it says, or you write, uh, Rush declared that a specific disease, leprosy, caused the blackening of African skins. Um, once physicians found a cure, he concluded Africans would turn white which would add greatly to their happiness. Uh, for however much they appear to be satisfied with their color, there are many proofs for their prefer preferring that of the white people. So maybe if you could, uh, when I read that, I was just taken aback 
because of its you know obvious um, shocking value. But mm -hmm. uh, maybe you could speak more why he. Absolutely. Um, so what um, what John is is referring to here is this kind of famous or today we would say infamous uh, uh, lecture, which is given before the American Philosophical Society, you know, unquestionably the most prestigious scientific body in the in the early republic modeled off of the Royal Society uh, in London a, a century earlier. And it's published in what I say to my students and the public is, you know, the equivalent of science or nature or JAMA, you know, the most prestigious scientific journals of the time. So this is taken very seriously, this idea, his theory that black skin, and he actually is speaking about black physical features uh, in general, hair type, facial features, et cetera, um, all of these are at root caused by a kind of vestigial disease caught in, in biblical times. This is an era in which it's not at all strange to use the Bible as a kind of historical source um, that, that basically Africans are descended from ancient, uh, that uh, you know, African-Americans are descended from ancient Africans. And in the Bible, it says that there was outbreaks of, of uh, leprosy near the Nile River and, you know, extrapolating from that, that, you know, one possible symptoms of, of leprosy in, in, in Russia's own time in the 18th century is, is you know, sometimes dark skin. Oh, this must be simply a holdover from, um, from, uh, from ancient times, from, from where, you know, ancestral Africans come. Um, so obviously, as John is pointing out and why I made it the opening sentence uh, of my of, or paragraph of, of that paper, um, and as well as a chapter of, of my book, is because, you know, coming with no knowledge, it is the strangest, you know, most grotesque, odd thing, um, racist thing that you can imagine someone saying. And what makes it doubly strange or especially strange is that this is coming by a leader of the anti-slavery movement. So six, seven years ago, when I came across this, uh, this uh, lecture, I, of course, wanted to make this seem understandable. How is this possible that someone who is such a vocal proponent of ending slavery uh, and even kind of considering living alongside black Americans in the, in the Republic can explain to a largely white audience that don't worry, their black skin is, uh, is what he says, it's not contagious like leprosy is. And that over time, if you free black people, get them in healthy conditions, uh, you know, not exploitative labor where their bodies will be physically harmed. Gradually over time, by some unclear process, their blackness will, will, which is to say, the vestiges of their ancient disease will fade away and they will start to look more like us. Uh, this is actually an anti-slavery argument. So figuring out how one can plausibly make that argument and not be laughed off the stage was kind of what, what drove that article. Yeah, and that, that was what uh, struck me too. And then you kind of um, tie it directly to where Rush came down on. He, he had a very strange, or not strange, but he had a very particular um, view of politics um, in view of, in light of this kind of, what you were talking about. Like if they're, if black people and ex-slaves are living in a specific type of, what's he calling it? yeoman agricultural right um maybe you could speak more about the uh, what that idea was the about. politics absolutely yeah, politics. so so in many ways um if the kind of main you know today we have republican democrat in, in the 1790s in the new republic the emerging political divide is between jeffersonian republicans that's one uh, forget about what the word means you know today republican but jefferson republicans and this is obviously jefferson is the kind of you know uh, leading figure. And while he, of course, is a one of the largest slaveholders in Virginia um, and is not at all uh, representative of the ideal that he promotes, what Jefferson promotes as the ideal way to create a stable democracy is if small landowning farmers um, are basically landed, they have a little bit of land. Um, and what he's, you know, implicitly, you know, um, uh, worried about is actually, you know, gross inequality, a small elite owning you know, the means of production, whether that's in the form of major slave owners like himself or, you know, industrial capitalists that are emerging. So his ideal is the small landed farmer, and that will create a kind of more equitable political base. Because keep in mind, uh, in this era, 
uh, voting is fundamentally based, you know, aside from the obvious things of, you know, race and gender, is really class. Uh, that is to say, you have to have land to be able to vote. Um, and this is the idea that, that Benjamin Rush is sympathetic to. Uh, and, you know, what's good for the health of the republic in a metaphorical sense, that is to say, you know, uh, equally distributed wealth, small uh, farm owners, not major, you know, landowners with, you know, a, a kind of captive labor force, whether that's enslaved people or simply wage earners. Um, and conversely, you know, uh, moneyed interests, right? The Hamiltonian idea um, I, I, is, is, the, is the rival um, political view of the 1790s. That's federalism, this idea of a strong central government that will kind of be favorable to banks uh, and to, you know, um, uh, kind of urban, um, urban cap, uh, sorry, I should say merchants, people who are selling stuff rather than let's say producing stuff, the small farmers. So this is the main divide. Rush is clearly sympathetic to, to Jefferson's kind of agrarian republic and how this ultimately ties into his science uh, is that he is constantly, not only with slavery, but slavery fits into it He's trying to kind of draw upon his medical knowledge, his knowledge of the body to argue that, you know, from a medical point of view, um, human bodies, uh, physical health will be best protected by certain uh, equal distribution of wealth and equitable distribution of labor, uh, which is another way of saying it sounds strange, but it isn't. If you're thinking that, look, anybody, think about today, right? Who is most uh, who is most um, likely to get sick and ill? People who have very physically demanding jobs, or even we can say, you know, stressful jobs from a personal point of view. So it seems strange, but it's not. And therefore, you know, um, being your being your own boss, running your own farm, having the actual physical labor that it entails, but not too much because you're your own boss will mean that you are healthy, physically healthy to withstand any infections. Similarly, if you're an enslaved person, you will be more predisposed to catch illnesses precisely because your body is constantly worn down. And he goes the other way too. That is to say, um, uh, planters and slaveholders and the kind of moneyed elite will also um, lead themselves to be predisposed to illness precisely because they're not getting enough exercise and because they have no thing to focus their attention and physical energies, they will, and you know, all their wealth is produced for them, they will be drinking a lot, smoking, gambling, um, and therefore predispose themselves to illnesses. So in this way, using medical knowledge, he's saying an agrarian republic not based on slave labor is the ideal um, healthy form to create a kind of healthy body, you know, of healthy individuals in the American republic. Yeah, now we're kind of seeing uh, fleshing out his one-two punch, right, against slavery. Right. Which exactly, is, exactly. Right. So it's uh, maybe we could now kind of delve more back into the, so if if enslaved people's diseases are caused by slavery. Right. And, well, yeah, a cop, yeah. yeah. There's, so ju ju I, I, I'm jumping back to the question, but there's two right. things, right? There's one is, what is causing, you know, uh, you know, human difference, what we today, you know, call race, you know, the social concept of race, you know, that's the shorthand that we use, but what is causing, you know, clearly physical differences uh, in at the very least how people look, darker skin, lighter skin, taller, shorter, whatever. Um, uh, Rush has two theories. One is the kind of just a question to forget about slavery, you know, why are Africans on their own continent not enslaved, you know, look different from Europeans or conversely, why do Europeans look different from Africans? He's trying to figure this out like, hundreds of scientists uh, in the, or men of science in this era are. Um, and the other thing is, okay, well, what about the specific conditions of slavery are contributing to Russia's theory of the causes of blackness? So there's actually, there's kind of a deeper rooted, you know, why are Africans darker skinned? And then the other one is why do they remain darker skinned? And that's what he's kind of putting together these two theories to, to you know, make a case for emancipating and debatably including freed Blacks into the American Republic. Again, that of course is the real conundrum of his thought. What does he actually think about um, the place for freed Black Americans in this Republic that's based uh, in theory on freedom and equality for all? All right, so I guess the following question is what does he think about where they're going to fit in? 
you know, I think this is a great debate. You know, I mean, my, my interpretation, uh, so just so people have the, the fuller context. Um, so as I said, right, this paper is both giving an explanation of the roots of blackness and it's important, which is to say, you know, it's an ancient disease, don't worry about it. It's not, it's not, um, it's not contagious. So white people don't need to be so fearful that you can't, you know, touch or converse with, um, with black people. Um, but he's also, Benjamin Rush is also, um, is his theory that it's caused by leprosy, that dark skin is caused by leprosy is never really taken up. Uh, in fact, he's ridiculed in public by uh, more radical uh, or, you know, federalist figures, uh, you know, his political opposites who are more actually at this, many of whom are actually more supportive of slavery than Jeffersonian Democrats. Um, and uh, so he's, he's, the, the leprosy theory isn't taken up. But one thing I want to, some people, scholars I would, I, who I disagree with, I think get this wrong, is that the fascination or the idea that Black people could turn white um, is not at all a weird idea um, amongst scientific elites. Uh, he, what he points to in that very same lecture is what we today, or physicians today, would call vitiligo, you know, the kind of loss of pigmentation in skin, and he finds people of African descent, along with dozens of other white men of science of all political stripes, and they use this as evidence that, oh, clearly black skin must be unnatural. There must be something wrong with black skin if there are instances in which black people very well in their minds seem to be turning white. So what this suggests, first of all, uh, regardless of your views on slavery, pro or anti or ambivalent, if you were a white man of science who was trained in uh, even a kind of more progressive scientific culture, like Benjamin Rush was, he was trained in, in Edinburgh, which was a kind of more progressive, uh, by that I mean liberal, more, more sympathetic to the American Revolution, to anti-slavery. These um, people really think that white skin, or at least fair skin, at least a lot of them do, is natural. And anything that's not white, uh, a European, is somehow um, unhealthy. Um, and while Rush's theory that it's caused by leprosy is never taken up, the idea that black people can turn white and that whiteness is the natural is, is a pretty common point of view. And again, one not simply held by pro-slavery ideologues, even it could be held by radically, you can say, anti-slavery figures like Benjamin Rush, who are saying, no, 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 this is a, a proof that we shouldn't be doing this to black people especially because look they're just like us they you know under their diseased skin they are white like us you shouldn't be they, they you shouldn't treat, treat them like this um so that you can turn this into an anti-slavery argument is is fascinating um and it just shows how widespread you know i guess you can say white normativity or whiteness or white superiority was uh, uh, amongst white people even those deeply sympathetic to enslaved people's plight yeah, that's, that's incredibly grotesque, but at the same time, understandable, I suppose. But I mean, because you couldn't, at the time, you couldn't address the, the humanity of African-Americans on its face. You had to right. somehow right. justify the, right. which so, is, yeah, go ahead. So I, let me just, because I realized that I totally didn't answer your question, if you don't mind me just jumping in. Uh, your question was, so what does he actually think about, you know, not only uh, getting rid of slavery, but incorporating Black people into the new republic? And I think that is, you know, the real important political question, because this is also something that we historians, particularly who study anti-slavery, are ourselves deeply divided over, not in terms of Rush per se, but of Rush's milieu, this kind of, uh, particularly these white anti-slavery figures who dominate these early organized societies before the 1830s. And this is, you know, there are some people, uh, Manisha Sinha, Paul Polgar, who are actually think, no, these guys actually did really believe that not only did Black people need to be free, but they needed to be, you know, given full and equal citizenship. And there are other people like uh, me and, and a kind of generation of, of scholars before me, um, who, David Brian Davis, who, who are more, my, my advisor, Chris Brown, who are more skeptical of um, who are more skeptical of the commitment to full racial, a racial egalitarian republic. And I, you know, I think at the end of the day, it probably comes up a lot to your individual figures. I think when it comes to Rush in particular, a very influential early abolitionist, of course, a white abolitionist, um, is I think he, this, this idea that if you free Black people and you know, turn them into good human Republican farmers. You know, they are just he's said he. You know, 
he is countering Jefferson and this emerging pro-slavery racial thought that's much better known these days that black people are innately inferior and they're fundamentally different from white people. He is upholding an older view that says that all human beings, regardless of their outward differences, are all fundamentally the same. So that Rush is holding to a very radical, universal, older view of you know, the development of the races, that we all are, are at the root the same and what explains our external differences are you know, the migrations of humans across the continent and different environments are causing different people to have different physical features. He's adding to that, amending that and turning it into something a little bit negative with the leprosy. But at root, he's saying, look, we're all human beings. We're all fundamentally the same. Um, and if you want to understand, I would argue, you know, what he ultimately thinks about Black people, uh, Black people's place once they're free in the New Republic, I think this kind of captures uh, the ambivalence. That is to say, he is both saying, I think that we can keep them here rather than send them to Africa. Keep in mind Jefferson and, and even kind of reform-minded um, uh, pro, you know, reform-minded slaveholders are saying, okay, I don't like this institution, but there's no way I'm going to live with enslaved people next to me as equal citizens. Let's send them out west, or eventually Liberia, uh, let's or Haiti, or or Mexico. I mean, Abraham Lincoln, you know, entertains these ideas, I and mean, this is kind of a common, you know, this it's called colonization, the idea of freeing black people and encouraging them to leave the United States because white people don't want to have to live as with free people as equal. So I think. Rush is very much immersed in this debate and he realizes that maybe the only way to convince white people that black people can say <laughs> can stay is to convince them medically that they will turn white that don't worry you know over time they will turn white so i think he's trying to have his cake and eat it too you know he's trying to cater to white racism uh, perhaps you know his own uh, and he's also trying to cater to his own you know I would argue deep felt belief that that these that that people of African descent are just as human as us, and there really isn't a reason why we shouldn't be giving them full political rights. And I think that helps explain the kind of conundrum of his of his you know racial politics. Well, that's uh, what happened. I guess in kind of closing, uh, to kind of uh, tie this up, what happens to Benjamin Rush? Does he go on to have a, or, you know, because your article is kind of, uh, the yellow fever kind of seems to be his uh, difficult his path for him. Yeah, his downfall. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's not, so yeah, so yellow fever is, a, is a, you know, similar to, to, you know, coronavirus today, this kind of recurrent, now we have Delta, so I can say recurrent, um, you know, contagious virus that is killing, uh, you know, hundreds of people, usually in cities. Um, and it happens every every few years. Um, uh, it's it's um, it's usually you know in kind of warmer you know hotter months. Uh, it's it's a it's a mosquito borne illness. We don't have it anymore. Um, and a major outbreak happens in 1794, and the medical community you know across the the Atlantic you know the Europe and America the Atlantic world uh, is really you know uh, always divided over what what is the cause and cure of this disease and. What does rush in is not so much, I mean, not so much his, his you know, belief of that black people will turn white, although one of his, you know, main political adversaries brings that up to mock him. What does him in is his belief in, in what's in becoming an increasingly um, scorned medical practice, and that's bloodletting. Uh, I, I won't go into the, the theory that makes blood, you know, drawing blood as a way to help a cure, but it does, it has to do with kind of the balance of the body and diseases that are, you know, believed to be causing, you know, what we today, I suppose, would say inflammation or, you know, them, it was humorial theory, there was a balance of the body, you need to let out blood to restore balance. Uh, and he was, you know, cutting people open left and right, and it wasn't clearly helping. Um, and this was used as a kind of reason to say Rush and his older school of medicine is outdated. Um, and he gets tied up in, in much controversy. The other controversy is a little bit more closely related to race, racism, and that's his, um, although it, it doesn't really uh, factor into his, you know, delegitimization, but, you know, he is actually, he's not just someone who talks about Black people, he's someone who is deeply involved with the national Black community. I mean, he is on close working terms with Absalom Jones, um, uh, Absalom Jones, um, Richard, why am I blocking on, uh, the main leaders of, uh, 
of Philadelphia's uh, free black community in the 1790s. He helped fund their free black churches, uh, their schools. Um, and he ultimately says, you know, and he changes his mind, this is critical. He says, hey, black people, it's widely believed are to be more immune to this disease. So he asks on black people to basically serve as nurses to say, hey, prove you can prove to Americans that you are, you know, very patriotic because you're going to go in there into these hospitals and you're immune or more immune and therefore help. But he quickly realizes from Absalom Jones uh, and others that black people are actually dying in very high numbers as well. And he actually changes his mind. He says, actually, my friend, you know, Absalom Jones uh, is saying that, you know, black people are just as, you know, uh, um, harmed by yellow fever. So he takes their side. Uh, black people's side and says, no, actually, they're just as harmed uh, by this disease. I stand corrected. Uh, and this, of course, only adds fuel to his, you know, diminishing reputation as a leading man of science. The last thing I'll say is that it's not only, uh, yes, his, his uh, reputation is harmed, but it's important to realize that Russia's influence far exceeds the ways in which this kind of moment in his career you know, uh, be, you know, at the turn of the 20th, 19th century, kind of dings or harms his career. He educates uh, some of the leading physicians, both anti-slavery ones, as well as rapidly racist um, uh, uh, men of science um, throughout the early Republic, who will go on 20 or 30 years later to make a unbridled case that Black people are innately inferior. They have zero possibility of becoming white or anything and therefore, slavery is fully justified. He's, of course, not responsible for their views, but it is to go to show that his reputation was so strong and his reputation helped build the reputations of many of these pro-slavery racist racial scientists who would emerge in the 1830s and 40s. Yeah, and that history is for another day, I suppose. That's for another day. That's for another <laughs> part two of the, of the series. That's right. Well, um, I think there's a ton more we could talk about, but this is a great place to leave it. So um, thank you again for uh, discussing Benjamin Rush and his uh, theories on race and medicine. And uh, if there's nothing else, I will. Any closing arguments or anything? No, that's it. Just thank you all. Um, you know, I encourage you to, you know, uh, reading as much as you can. Um, my book, The Science of Anti-Slavery, Rana Hogarth was mentioned, Medicalizing Blackness. Uh, um, and and uh, Sasha Turner has wonderful um, books and, and Catherine Pa. There's wonderful Sumon Seth. There's a whole crop of scholars who are, who are dealing with these issues um, uh, that I encourage you to, to uh, read their work, uh, which is accessible um, online.